Welcome back to Larry's Classroom. Today we will begin our study of basic electronics. My recommendation is that you watch these lectures and get yourself some kind of a book to supplement your learning. I'm using this particular book as a resource. It's called Grob Basic Electronics. It was written by Bernard Grob and this particular edition is the seventh edition. It doesn't really matter what book you use. Any book, if you look through the table of contents, you can find material very similar to what we talked about in the lectures, and I think it would be to your benefit to read the material in addition to watch seeing the lectures. And one nice thing about this being a video, of course, you can watch the lectures multiple times if you so desire. Anyway, let's begin. Any study of uh, electricity, electronics, is going to begin with the negative and positive polarities and particles and such. Now we have two basic particle, charge carrying particles in our universe and those are electrons which carry a negative charge and protons which carry a positive charge. Now both of these particles have equal quantity of charge but opposite signs. So when they form elements, the normal state of the element, and what we'll draw, we'll start with a simple uh, hydrogen atom. We have a, a positively charged proton and orbiting in a shell around this positively pro charged proton we have a negatively charged electron. Now these charges they balance each other so that the complete hydrogen atom will have no net charge. It will be neutrally charged. There is an attraction, opposite charges, there's an attraction between these, this uh, electron and this proton. This is one of the characteristics of charges. Now work is done to separate these charges and that's how we get to where we have usable usable electricity. If we have the positive and negative charges in uh, balance nothing can happen. But when we do work and maybe get a a positively charged proton over here and a negatively charged electron over here, some force pushed these apart and there's a potential to do work because they want to come back together. Now in a battery this separation is done by a chemical action. Other things in generators and such, electromagnetism and rotating the shaft will cause this to happen. But we need a difference in charge to to make a, or a difference in potential to make electricity work for us. Now the we have elements and an element is basically some nucleus consisting of some number of protons. I'm going to just draw two of them here. and orbiting around that will be, if it's a neutrally charged atom, it will be a uh, two electrons. Now elements are made of a single type of atom and cannot be separated into other types of atoms by electrical forces. Electrical forces can cause this this uh, electron to be separated from this 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 is a helium atom by the way can cause that to be separated from that uh, atom. It's still a helium atom, but now because we've removed a negative charge, we have a net positive charge two plus one minus, and we've created what's called an ion. When we create a charge, when we charge a particle charge an atom by removing an electron we create an ion. 
And this removal of this electron is a positively charged ion. We're going to talk about a couple of different elements now. We're going to start by talking about carbon. Carbon is number six on the periodic chart, and that is an indication that it has six six positively charged protons in its nucleus. Now. You can also have neutral charge neutrons in the nucleus, and depending on what isotope is, it can be different amounts. For electrical purposes, we're mostly interested in the charged particles. Now, the same carbon atom will have two shells of electrons. There will be an inner shell which will have two negatively charged electrons. And then there will be an outer shell, which will have four negatively charged electrons. So this is, we have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six protons. So this, this, carbon atom is in balance. It, it is not charged. It has uh, an equal number of protons and an equal number of neutrons. Now let's mention quickly the mass. This particular carbon atom that we've drawn up here, most of the mass is in what is called the nucleus. The nucleus of the atom. And that is, the reason for that is a proton is approximately 1840 times as massive as an electron. So you can see, removing a single electron doesn't change the total mass of that carbon atom very much. <clears throat> a way to visualize this might be to think of a ton of rock in the back of your pickup truck and a pound of butter in your, in your hand. That's a ratio of 1 to 2,000, because a ton is 2,000 pounds, but it gives you a little bit of intuitive insight into how much more massive the protons are than the neutrons. We're going to talk a little bit about about copper now, which copper we we use a lot in electricity because we make many of our wires out of copper. Copper is an excellent conductor. Copper has instead of two shells, as the carbon did, it has it has uh, four four shells. I'm just going to draw, I'm going to say plus 29. Copper's 29 on the periodic table, and copper has 29 protons in its, in its uh, nucleus. I'm not going to draw all 29 little circles. In its first shell, then it's going to still have two, it's going to have two electrons in its first shell. Now the first shell on any atom never has more than two electrons. The first, the first shell has one or two if it's a neutrally charged uh, atom. Now if it was a hydrogen atom and we kicked out one electron, we have basically just left basically a proton, but we sometimes call a proton a hydrogen nucleus as well. Now the second shell of the hydrogen atom, I mean the copper copper atom, can have eight electrons in it. But 
my little negative signs here to indicate their electrons. So now we've put 10 of the electrons in there. The third shell will have 18. I don't think I'm going to, well, maybe I'll draw all 18. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, a couple more here, 17. So in our third shell of the high, of the copper atom, we have 18 electrons. In the outer shell, we only have one. So let's count these. One, two. There's two. We have eight. We have 18. And we have one. So 19 and 8 is 27 and 229. That gets us to a neutrally balanced copper atom. One thing you'll notice is the outer shell has only one. That is one of the things that makes copper a good conductor. Because that lone electron in the outer shell, which we call the valence, it can give up fairly easy to allow electron current flow. You recall that the uh, copper, I'm just going to quickly draw a carbon, which is plus six. I'm going to write, write copper here. I'm going to use the symbol Cu. And carbon was just a C, I believe. C. The, we're just going to draw the outer shell. We're not going to draw the inner shell. The innermost shell of any atom can be one or two. The outermost shell can be one through eight electrons. Shells further down in that can have varying amounts. The, uh, the second shell can have up to eight. The third shell can have eight or 18, depending on what, electro what, uh, what element it is and so on. We'll talk a little more about that in a little bit, but because you can have up to eight, we have for copper, we have what's called a plus one valence or we can also say this is a minus seven valence. The, the plus one, the extra electron, makes it a fairly good conductor. Now carbon, being the shell, the outer shell can have eight, we can look at that as a plus four or a minus four valence. And this is what, why carbon falls into what we call the semiconductor region. It's got a, it's as much like a conductor as it is like an insulator kind of, because it's got a half filled outer shell. The valence is plus or minus four, depending on which way you want to look at it. So we talk a little bit more about conductors. We're going to erase this here. Conductors, as I've been kind of leading up to, are material that have a few number of electrons in their valence or outer shell, which they can easily share easily give up and move to another atom, which is how you get electron current flow. Insulators are different than that. Most of our insulators are uh, compounds, and a compound is made up of multiple elements, but nonetheless, insulators are such that they do not easily give up electrons. As a matter of fact, many insulators, to give up electrons, you literally got to burn them up. You may have seen a case where arcing caused a piece of plastic to turn black or something. But an insulator doesn't easily share electrons, where, where a conductor shares electrons quite easily, or gives up electrons quite easily, allows them to move. 
A semiconductor is kind of in the middle. And the semiconductors like uh, copper, I mean carbon, germanium, silicon, they all have four valence electrons. So they kind of fall between insulators and fall and conductors. Now, as we talked about, elements are made of a single atom. An element is going to have a nucleus of some number of of electro of protons plus we're going to say plus plus eight. What is eight? Let's just go back. Let's go plus twenty nine. We'll talk about copper. Plus twenty nine, and then around the outside, we're going to have minus twenty nine electrons. We can electrically cause electrons to move from these atoms, but it is still a copper copper atom because we have not changed the nucleus. Changing the nucleus involves nuclear reactions, which this course is not about nuclear reactions. This course is electrical reaction actions. Of course, the atom is the smallest particle of the element, which in elegant divided will still be the same element as we just talked about. If we split the atom, we turn it into another element. talk about a molecule like water and we're going to we're going to draw our atoms as simple circles right now h h o this represents a water molecule which you've probably heard talked about as being h2o it has two atoms of hydrogen and two elements a two a single atom of oxygen bound into a single molecule a molecule, if we split this single molecule into something smaller, which it could be done, it could be split up into maybe an H to HH and an O. Now we've got an H2, a molecule of, of hydrogen, and a single oxygen atom. This can be done by electrical forces. It doesn't require nuclear forces to split a compound molecule into smaller pieces. But you, you'll notice that the uh, that the elements still remain the same element. We did not split the atom into anything different. But the molecule is the smallest that we can split up a compound and still call it, still have it be the same compound, have the same characteristics. You notice here when I split this molecule of water, it's no longer water. We got gaseous hydrogen, gaseous oxygen. So uh, that's as far as we can split up a compound is to a single molecule. Hydrogen often travels around it as an H2 molecule, H, H, and we can electrically separate that through electrical forces and such. It's still hydrogen, but it'll probably have slightly different characteristics in how it works as a gas when you split the, that apart, and it'll probably combine together fairly easy back into a H2 molecule, but it's still hydrogen. When we split the the water molecule was no longer water. Now on the uh, we're going to look at the valence of some of the uh, conductors. Silver that's got a plus one. Gold usually plus one. And copper, as we've already talked about, plus one. 
this extra electron in the outer, I shouldn't call it extra because it's still a neutrally balanced atom, but this electron in the valence by itself is fairly easy to remove to allow it to take part in an electric current. Semiconductors such as uh, carbon, silicone, and germanium all have the plus or minus four. Plus or minus four, plus or minus four. So, so they can act kind of like a conductor and kind of like an insulator. And let's talk just a little bit about a few of the inert gases. Inert gases, if you're familiar with the periodic table, you'll see all those over in the far right side of the periodic table. They have a full <coughs> valence with eight electrons in it. So they, we call that a valence of zero. It means there's no easily released electrons and you know helium neon argon all these are what we call inert gases and they do not form compounds compounds are are formed by the sharing of the valence valence electrons create what we call covalent bonds so on the inert gases with the full valence of eight electrons we have no extras that's why we call that a valence of zero The, the shells are labeled, they're labeled uh, from the, from the uh, inner to the outer. We're going to draw our, our positively charged uh, neutron. We have the K shell, the L shell, the M shell, the N shell, the P and the Q shell. We'll draw a little. And these shells may not appear in every atom because this example, we did carbon, it only had two shells. Copper had four. Depends on what the atomic number, how many protons, and how many electrons it needs to carry out there. <clears throat> the K shell, which is hydrogen and helium, it can have up to two electrons in it. The L shell it can have up to eight electrons in it, which, as you can see, the L shell, even with surveillance, can have eight. Now, any of these shells other than the inner shell, as the valence, I'm going to draw the numbers of valence here, they can have eight, up to eight, if they're the outermost shell. But when they're not the outermost shell, things get a little different. The M shell here can have up to 18 when it's not the outermost shell. The N shell, if it's not the outermost shell, it can have eight or eighteen or eighteen electrons depending on what element it is. The same is true with the well the N shell can have I'll get that backwards. The M shell can be eight or eighteen. The N shell can be eight, eighteen or thirty two. The P shell can have 8 or 18, and the Q shell can have up to 8. We have on our a total of 106 elements that we normally see occurring 
in nature. And that's probably why we don't go beyond eight out here. The uh, We don't really need to get too concerned about this 8 or 18 or this 8, 18 or 32 or the 8, 18 for electrical characteristics. Mostly we're interested in whatever the outer shell, what the valence of the outer shell is. And that can be anywhere from 0 to 7. 0 would be a full shell with 8 electrons. 7 would be a shell with seven electrons, one short of being full, and one through six, so on in between. These are the ones that interest us for electrical characteristics. The way these fill up differently has got to do with what they call suborbital orbitals and energy levels. That's more of a subject for a chemistry course. We don't really need to cover that too much in, in our electrical course here. It's nice to know that it exists, but it's not, it's not going to be a situation that we deal with. We're going to be mostly interested in what the outer shell is, which is going to be if it's hydrogen or helium, or helium, it's going to be one or two electrons, which would be a valence of plus or minus one or zero. If it was one electron, we can say that was plus or minus one valence. It was two, it would be full, so it would be zero. All other elements we're going to have a valence it's from zero to seven. The zero being the full shell, and that's in the inert gases, neon, argon, so on. And with the up here, helium also inert gas. That was the zero, and let two electrons. But for electrical characteristics. <coughs> The valence is what's going to matter to us. And it can be 1 to 7 with the low numbers like 1 or 2 being probably good conductors. The middle one like 7, I mean like 4 plus or minus 4 being semiconductors. So atomic structure, even though you don't think about it every day, we'll do electronics, is an important part of electronics. We talked a little bit about the nucleus. We said that the nucleus was made of protons. They're positively charged. And I'll, I'll draw some unknown number of neutrally charged neutrons on here. The nucleus is stable for non-radioactive elements. Some uh, radioactive elements, the, the, nu the nucleus will naturally decay through the, race of, through the emission of radioactivity and reduce to lesser elements on, on the periodic table. But for electrically, we're interested in stable elements and in non-radioactive elements, the, the nucleus is a stable nucleus. We're going to talk a little bit about the mass. Let's do a quick, quick, quick talk. Well, we've talked about the mass of the proton and we said that it's 1840 times approximately that of electron. The mass of a neutron is very, very similar, it's slightly different, but it's pretty much the same mass as a
as a proton. Now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, charge and such. If we rub two insulating device pieces together, such as you know paper and hard rubber or glass and silk cloth, we will cause a separating of charges. We did some work there with the friction and we caused some of the electrons from one object to flow to the other, so we end up with one object negatively charged and one object positively charged. And because we're rubbing insulating or dielectric materials, those charges will, will tend to stay present in that material. Now the charge of one electron is very small. So we think of charge usually in terms of what we call coulombs. Now we're going to do a little quick talk about scientific notation because I want to provide you the required math as we go along. If, if I write down here 1.3 times 10 to the second, what does this mean? Well, 10 to the second is equal to 100. So that's 1.3 times 100, but we can multiply by 100 by moving the decimal place two places right, so that's basically 1,300. Now this is a compact way of writing large numbers, not so important for numbers like, you know, 1,300 or 130, but when you're talking about very large numbers, it becomes more important or more useful. Now we're going to talk a little bit about powers of 10. First of all, 10 to the 0 is equal to 1. Matter of fact, 1 to the 0 equals 1. 2 to the 0 equals 1. 17 to the 0 equals 1. So any number raised to the 0 power equals 1. So if I give you something like this, 1.738 times 10 to the 0 being we know 10 to the 0 equals 1 and when you multiply 1 you don't change anything this is just simply 1.738 so we're going to take a we're going to go 10 to the minus 2 10 to the minus 1 10 to the 0 10 to the 1 10 to the 2. We're going to figure out what each of these is. Well, I'm going to tell you what they are, but 10 to the 0, we just heard it was 1. 10 to the 1, or to the first, is equal to 10. 10 to the second is equal to 100. Now, if we just put a little decimal place right there, I'm not going to do it there. I'm going to go 1.0. Move the decimal place zero places either way, gave us a 1. 1.0. Here we move the decimal place 1 to the right, that gave us a 10. Again, we take the same number, 1, move it 2 to the right, that gave us the 100. So basically, this number up here, this exponent, we're multiplying 10 times 10 times 10 or whatever, or 10 times 10 or 10 times 10 or 10 times 10 times whatever, this number of times, but we can easily visualize what it comes out to by just taking 1 and moving the decimal places. If it's positive to the right, that number, if it's negative to the left, that number. For example, this 10 to the minus 1, if we start with a, that 1.0, and we move, now we're going negative, we want to move that decimal point to the left, it becomes 0 0.1, or basically 1 tenth. 10 to the minus 2, if we have the 1.0, and we move the decimal points two places to the right, or to the left, we end up with 0 0.001, or 100th. 
So converting scientific notation numbers to uh, just regular written numbers with, without uh, thinking about much math of it, if I have 2.74 times 10 to the minus 2. Move our decimal place two places to the left. 1, 2, we've got to add a 0 here. So we have 0 0.0274 is the, is, the, is the number in our standard notation rather than scientific notation. If we have a number like 6.8 times 10 to the 0, well, no movement there, that's going to just be 6.8. If we have 7.3 times 10 to the 3rd, move our decimal place 3 places to the left. There's 1, 2, 3, gives us a 7,300. So, We've talked a little bit about scientific notation. Here's the reason I want to talk about that. A coulomb of charge is a very large, um, it's the charge of a very large number of electrons or protons. 6.25 times 10 to the 18th. Okay, one coulomb, quantity Q is the symbol for charge. If it's one coulomb, that is equal to the quantity of charge of 6.25 times 10 to the 18th prot electrons or protons. And whether it's electrons or protons is the determining factor whether it's a positive charge or a negative charge. Now some some places you'll see this number, 6.25 times 10 to the 18th. Now if we take the 6.25, we actually would write it out. 1, 2, we, if we move the decimal place two places, we have 625, and then we've got to add 16 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Big number, 6.24. Some places you'll see 6.24. If we use this number, it would be the same thing almost, 6.24. These are almost the same number. The reason you'll see a difference occasionally depends on when they how precise they define the charge of a single electron. You'll see electrons defined as 1.6 times 10 to the minus 18th Coulomb. And there we moved it 18 places to the left because we've got the negative number. Or you might see it defined as 1.602 times 10 to the minus 18th That's a little better here. You can see these numbers are very close to the same number. This one would be like this one here would be like 1.600. You see there's not a lot of difference between 1.600 and 1.6202 just in that third decimal place. But when you define this a little more precisely as this, you end up with a coulomb of electrons being roughly that charge. When you define it not quite so precisely, you end up with a coulomb of electrons being 6.25. We're going to use 6.25 times 10 to the 18th in, in our discussions here. Nobody's wrong when they say 6.24. Nobody's wrong when they say 6.25. This is just a little more precise. We're not going to do a great deal of careful calculations with that number. We want to understand what that number is about. So it's not going to be a real 
big problem either way, which you use. Now we're going to talk about how charges, how charges react. You've probably heard that like charges is repel and opposite charges attract. So let's think about what this means. If we have a, a piece of two pieces of silk thread, the reason we're using silk thread is because they're a good insulator. And we put on the bottom of that silk thread a little styrofoam ball. Again, we're using that because the styrofoam is a really good insulator. If we are to, if we apply a positive charge to one of the balls, styrofoam balls, and a negative charge together. Now we have light charges. What will happen is they will tend to move towards each other like this. And in the early days of electrical experimenting, they discovered this by, they might have taken a piece of glass, rubbed it with a silk cloth, and touched one, one insulating ball with with the glass rod and the other insulating ball with the with the silk cloth to charge them the same charge as the silk cloth the same charge as the as the glass which would be opposite and they probably saw something like this happen now if we by the same token let's say we make these both positively charged and you could do that by separating the charges by friction like we talked about and then using the glass rod on both of them or the or the uh, cloth on both of them, we'll see a different reaction here. We will see that these insulating balls tend to move away from each other when we charge them both positively. And by the same token, if we charge them both negatively, we see the same thing happen. So we've, we've talked about how like charges attract and unlike charges repel each other. I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit more about charge. If we have a a charged body of some kind, and then that body we have that charge with twelve. 0.5 times 10 to the 18th electrons with a charge of 12.5 times 10 to the 18th electron. Now we know that's a negative charge because they're electrons and we also know that we, we talked about a little bit ago the 1 coulomb equals the charge of 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrons. So if we use the Q for the quantity charge, that would be a negative. One negative Q is is the ch is one coulomb, and it's the charge is 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrons. So when we have 12.5 times 10 to the the charge of 12.5 times 10 to the 18th electrons on that body, you'll notice that 6.25 is half of 12.5. So we have a we have a charge here minus Q equal to two coulombs. Now if we take the same body and we charge it with 12.5 times 10 to the 18th protons, and how would we do that? Because the protons are, if this is a solid, the protons are in the nucleus and they're kind of uh, trapped as part of the material, we would do that by taking away this number of electrons. But now since we've taken away electrons, we now have a, a quantity of charge equal to plus Q equal to one Coulomb or, or the charge 
amount, the magnitude of the charge of 6.25 times 10 to the 18th protons. Now we're going to make one more example. We have this same thing. We've got it charged with 6 point, with 12.5 times the 10 to the 18th protons, which we did by taking electrons away from it. We have a quantity of charge of 1 coulomb. Well, here's it defines 1 coulomb. We have a quantity of charge of 2 coulombs. Now if we add to this body, if we add to that body the charge of 12.5 times 10 to the 18th electrons, we've basically added back in the electrons that we took away to get the positive charge. And this here, the positive charge from elect or the negative charge from electrons. And the positive charge from the, from the protons, which are equal number, will cancel each other. So when we put them electrons back in there, into that body, we are now at zero charge, where our Q will now equal zero, which is the indication that it is neutrally char no charge. Back in 1909, R.A. Milken, using the, what he called the oil drop experiment, where he balanced charged drops of oil against the, the pull of gravity, he quantized, found the charge of the electron to be 0 0.16 times 10 to the minus 18 coulombs. <clears throat> Now, if you take the reciprocal of that, and you take 1 and divide it by 0 0.16 times 10 to the minus 18th, you end up with that 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrons needed to make 1 coulomb of charge. So the 6.25 times 10 to the 18th, the the charge on that many electrons or that many protons depending on the uh, whether there's a positive or negative charge is equal to the reciprocal or 1 divided by the charge on an individual proton or an individual electron. I'm going to talk a little bit about electric field. And I'm going to, any charged particle, an electron or proton is a charged particle and they're also called a charged carrier. An electron itself is not a negative charge and a proton itself is not a positive charge, but they carry, a, the proton carries a positive charge and the electron carries a negative charge. So you'll often hear them referred to as charged carriers. <clears throat> now, around any charged particle, there is an electric field that forms around that thing. An electric field decreases by the square of the distance in strength. So if you double the distance, the strength of the field becomes less. And this is why I've made these inner arrows to be longer than the outer arrows. This is an indication of the, we'll make some real short ones out here, reducing strength of the field as we get further from its source. Now the, 
the direction of electric field is defined as a direction in which a positive particle such as a proton will be the for the direction which the force upon a positive particle such as a proton will be if we were to put a proton into that field. So if I was to put a, a positive particle, single proton in that field, and we see these arrows are pointing out, that's an indication that's being repelled. So we know that it, that, that particular electric field is being created by a positively charged particle, or a bunch of positively charged particles. <coughs> So, the direction of the field is the direction at which the force upon a positive charged particle would be. And we measure it with a single particle, but we're, we're not measuring it right now, so... Now, we'll talk about what's called the volt unit of potential difference. Potential. This is the ability to do work. If we have a positive charge here and a negative charge here, they want to attract each other so that force inward could do some work somehow. And we had to apply some work to press them, to separate them. So we're basically getting back work that was put into the system at some time. We ha but we have to have, well, e e even if we have positive charges out here, we could, we could, same thing, two positive charges are going to be able to do work by pushing away from each other, and some work had to be done to push them together to get them in the position they were in also. So the potential t to do work has to do with the difference in charge. Now if we have here some mass here, some mass here, and this thing is I got a, a plus one coulomb charge, and this has got a plus three coulomb charge. And in the middle here we have some mass that's negatively charged. We're just gonna we're not going to worry about the quantity of it, but what do we see here? We have this plus charge and negative charge. So that's this charge is. We're going to put this mass right in the very center. This charge is going to attract that object, the one coulomb. Will attract it in that direction. And we're going to quickly talk about what a vector is. A vector is a direction and a magnitude. This vector, I'm going to just say, has one as its as its value, but it also has a direction which is to the left. This alone is not a vector. When you add this direction, it becomes a vector. So we're moving, we have a force moving this mass in this direction. Now from this particular 3 Coulomb charge, we have an, another vector trying, a force vector trying to move that mass in that direction. Now you add vectors by putting tip to tail. So I'm going to start right here. This, this dot is a tail, the arrow is a tip, but this vector is three times as much. One, two, three. So we have a force from this charge trying to move this negatively charged mass to the right. And we're going we're to use the value of 3 and we're going to say right. And we have a force from this charge trying to move this mass to the left. 
and we add them tip to tail. So basically, the resultant vector is this piece, which is going to be 2 to the left. We have one charge tugging at the left, another charge tugging at the right. The charge tugging at the right is a stronger charge, so it's tugging a little harder. So the net difference is this, this two units of force to the right. Now we're going to change these charges and going to draw some new, new force vectors. So basically we've got no charge here. And now we got plus two here instead of the plus three. So same mass, same charge. So we got nothing pulling to the left. We've only got this thing here pulling to the right with a, a, a force of, created by two coulombs of charge. Didn't change this any, same, same mass, still not exactly in the middle here. So now we have the force created by two coulombs to the right, just like we had before. So the net difference determined how much force on that body there was. We'll do one more example there. We're gonna we're gonna put uh, negative one coulomb here, and we're gonna put positive one coulomb here. So first we're gonna look at the the force from the from the charge on the left. Now notice negative, negative. So now it's a repulsive charge, so this charge is going to put a force to the right on the body. So we'll start right there, and it's a force of, created by one coulomb. And so we're going to go one, and we'll go right. In those circles. Now what, what happens with the, the next charge? We have a one coulomb, but now it's not here. They're opposite. So we're going to be putting a force towards the right on this charged, negatively charged body with this positive charge over here. But this is also going to be a charge of one coulomb, created by one coulomb. So we have an additional one here to the right. For a total, two to the right. And you notice in each of these examples, we ended up with the same net amount of force on the charged body. So we have to add them vectorally and basically being they were opposite signs, one pushed it to the right and the other one pulled it to the right to add it up. In the prior examples they were all either zero or positive. We had one that wasn't pulling so we only had the one to the right. The first example we had some attraction to the left, some attraction to the right and the difference. But in every case, well, what did we have? We had, we had uh, one and three. That was a difference of, that was a difference of two. We had zero and two. That was a difference of two. And we had minus one in the last example, minus one, and plus one again, a difference of two. So even though we had different charges on the left and the right in every case from. The net difference between the two was always the same, so we ended up with the same amount of force being exerted on our charged object. <clears throat> now, we're going to talk about what's called the volt unit of potential difference. The volt unit. The volt unit a potential difference. The volt is defined the volt unit a potential difference is a measure of the work required to move an electric charge. And it's basically 0 
foot-pounds of work is required to move a one coulomb ch charge so if we have a one coulomb charge we're gonna we don't care if it's a electrical or we're in electric field and we'll call this a positive electric field and we have here a one coulomb of electrons charge if the work required to move it from from point A to point B is equal to 0 0.7376 foot-pounds then the potential difference in voltage the volt potential difference from from point A to B would be one volt now another term for this is also called the joule this 0 0.7376 foot-pounds of work is equal to one joule of work and that's your metric type of uh, thing now it wouldn't make any difference which direction you were moving this charge you would have to put force in this direction to move it A to B if you're moving BDA, it wants to go, so you would have to use a resistive force in the same direction. So it's the the work required and, and work, or the work given back. When you're pushing it this way, you're putting work into that charged body. When it's when you're allowed to go this way, that body's putting work into you, whatever you're using to motivate this thing. Now we sometimes think about what we call the electromotive force, or EMF. EMF, electromotive force. Electromotive force is the force that is put into a system to create the potential difference. If you have a battery and you have a positive terminal and a negative terminal. There's some chemistry going on in here. And chemically, there's a force that's going to end up causing a surplus of electron, of electrons on the negative terminal and a deficiency of electrons. On the, on the positive terminal and as we talked about before electrons are negatively charged or surplus electrons makes a negative charge deficiency of electrons leaves behind positive charge the EMF is the force that separates these charges and causes the potential difference at terminals of battery potential difference is the difference between these charges and we just talked about it. the work required to go through from here to here would tell us the value of that but uh, oftentimes you see EMF and voltage the potential difference is usually measured in voltage and the EMF is measured as E 
We often see these kind of used interchangeably. They're not really completely inter interchangeable. The electromotive force is the force that separates the charges. And once they're separated, it keeps them separated while you're drawing a load off of that. The potential difference, which we normally call the voltage, is what that charge difference is. So uh, I think that'll wind up our lecture for today. I hope uh, everybody had a good time, learned a few things, and you know, be sure to rewind and watch the parts that you think are need a little bit more reinforcement of. Read about them in your book, and uh, also be sure to subscribe so you get uh, notifications when new lectures come out and such. And thanks for tuning in. And until the next time, keep on learning. When reviewing this video, I realized I had made a couple of mistakes. T about 21 minutes and 21 seconds in, I said inert gases all have a full valence of 8 electrons. But this isn't completely correct. All the inert gases have a full valence of 8 electrons, with the exception of helium, which only has 2 electrons. Another thing that I said wrong, about 22 minutes and 22 seconds into the video, I referred to a particle as a positively charged neutron. Of course, we know that neutrons have no charge. And what I should have said, it was a positively charged proton. I was referring to a proton at, at the time, and I actually referred to it as a neutron. Now, th about 38 minutes and 35 seconds into the video, I gave the electron charge as 1.6 times 10 to the minus 18th, or 1.602 times 10 to the minus 18th. Now, this is an incorrect number. It's 0 0.16 times 10 to the minus 18th, or 0 0.1602 times 10 to the minus 18th. To use this 1.6 times, it should be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th, or 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th. I, by having the 1 before the decimal point, I need a little bit bigger number here for the, a, a larger magnitude for the, magnet, for the exponent. At 41 minutes and 23 seconds into the lecture, I drew two charges, a plus and a minus, and I refer to them as like charges, but they're actually unlike charges, which is kind of obvious from the video because you saw that they attracted, but I, I inadvertently referred to them as like charges. They were not like charges. They were unlike charges. At 55 minutes and 21 seconds into the video, I got my right and my left confused. I wrote and said the force was to the left, and the force was actually to the right. So uh, I hope these corrections, I don't want to lead anyone astray, so I felt like I had to make them. And thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you later.